First, we must heal ourselves. And when we align our daily life around a higher intention, we integrate our mind, our body, our emotions, our energy to a conscious higher intention or purpose. We also feel more powerful because we realize that we are consciously choosing to make a difference, even in the smallest things that we do. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. Today, I'll be talking with best-selling author and visionary Michael Gelb, a pioneer in the field of creative thinking, the author of at least 16 books, including Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, and the co-author of one of the most brilliant and needed books today, The Healing Organization. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about how we can change the way we work, awaken the conscious of business, and help save the world. So welcome back to the show, Michael. Are you ready to shine? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you, you are by far the, the maestro of the intro of anyone who does anything like this. You're the best, man. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, then my job is done. However, yeah. <laughs> I guess we should ask some questions. So first, before we dive right into things, what's one thing, one thing all of us can do at work today, whether we're the leader or a janitor? to begin to change the world? The smallest action in terms of how you interact with other humans has a bigger effect than you might imagine. So wherever you are, yes, now it is true, of course, if you are senior in some hierarchy, you have even more profound influence on people for better or for worse. But even if you are the janitor, even if you are on your first day at work, just beginning your career, most people underestimate the influence they have on others, and that influence is immediate. There's a lot of research now. Uh, Professor Jane Dutton, Monica Warline, and others found that one of the really the keys to a positive culture at work, what they call HQCs, and that stands for high quality connections. So literally just smiling genuinely greeting people warmly, seeing the soul in others changes their day. But here's, here's, here's the real secret of this. If you take ownership of your power in that way, Thank you. then you awaken your own soul in every interaction. You thereby strengthen your own personal power. You build your charisma you're a lot more likely to evolve into a leader. So it begins with just the simplest actions and attitudes and behaviors towards one another, whatever level you happen to be. Thank you. And I look at us, I, I, and I, I joke, I say it all the time, even as a non-joke, that we are each a bright and shiny beacon of light. I believe that we're each a sun, we're each radiating light. It's often for myself, I try not to judge anyone or anything, but I get a good idea of a take of a company or a corporate culture by the person on the end of the phone or by the person that I come in, not just even the receptionist, but the security guard, if there's security, if they're a bright and shiny beacon of light, they're affecting everyone around them. And it's both top down and bottom up. And I, and I wouldn't say that that's being judgmental. I'd say that's being discerning. And I'm with you 100% that I get a take on your whole culture, your whole organization, your whole business is communicated to me by the tone of voice yes. of the person answering the telephone, of the greeting I get when I check into your hotel or go up to the gate to enter my flight. Mm -hmm. All those micro interactions are everything you've ever worked for are all right there. So, and uh, you know, look, who do you want to do business with? This is the healing organization is a business book. Yes. Yes. It says that you'll do better business if you are a shining light in all your interactions, if you bring out the best in yourself and others, every chance that you get, this is a better way to do business. And think you know, really simply, like if you, if you, you're thinking about going out to eat, yeah. You, you met my wife briefly yes. when we were getting ready for our interview. And she'll tell you, I have really good restaurant radar. So if we're walking somewhere, 
I will find the best place. We were we were in Belgium not long ago, and I was walking along the street, and I just said, "This is the place." And we had a ph- such a phenomenal meal. I think we ate there all three nights that we were there because the you could feel the energy of the place was celebrational. You could feel that they cared about what they did, not in a pretentious way, but just in a soulful way. So if you're running a restaurant, that's how you want people to feel because and, and they're not going to feel that way if you don't care for all the people who work in the restaurant because you can't just focus on the customer. If you're not treating the, the person who greets your guests well, how are they supposed to genuinely greet the guests as though they're happy to see them? And and this actually this is one of the stories in our in our book the uh, Union Square Hospitality Group, yeah. Danny Meyer his national chain is uh, Shake Shack, but in the New York area which is pretty tough, competitive restaurant business, his restaurants have been number one rated in all of New York more than anybody else's by far, and it's because he has that sense of caring and celebration of the unique talents and abilities of each of the people in his organization. And he does his best to bring out the best in those people. And then those people love serving you when you go there and that's, you can taste it. I mean, it makes the food taste better, makes you feel welcome and happy. And and this is not, these are not inexpensive restaurants, but you feel like you got the value because in a way that's priceless. Are the days of Chainsaw Al over? And can we vote with how we behave and our dollars to change the companies and thereby, I think it was Lawrence Ford who we had on the show who said, he who has the tallest skyscrapers rules the world, thereby change the world. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> We're done. You know, you know, I'm just, I mean, I'd like to tell you, you know, I have some messianic vision and I know that this is true. Uh, uh, maybe we're going to i all i know my my vision is once you realize it's possible to be more successful by being consistently kind by focusing on the needs of all your stakeholders why would you do anything else and once people realize that even you know, people some people and it, it's not it's not it's not just a wild and crazy belief. Some people have grown up with the notion that because they read the wealth of nations by Adam Smith, yeah. they thought, you know, and, and it's one of the genius ideas in, in human history that freedom leads to prosperity. So Adam Smith in the wealth of nations laid out the contemporary vision of capitalism, that the free exchange of goods and services would result in prosperity and abundance, assuming there's rule of law try to keep the government out of it as much as possible because people will regulate themselves to look after one another's needs. And that's a really good idea. However, Adam Smith wrote another book 17 years before the wealth of nations. He wrote the theory of moral sentiments Mm -hmm. in which he laid the groundwork that this exchange had to be, had to take place in a context of empathy and caring. And we've lost touch through the doctrine of shareholder primacy with the empathy and caring. We're decimating the planet. And look, uh, I don't even I don't use the term climate change or global warming because they they don't they're not what we have is atmospheric cancer. Yeah. Uh, so that that changes your whole way of of thinking about it. I'm, it's not the planet is the problem. It's us. The planet's going to be fine. Yeah. Uh, a million years from now, the planet will be 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 just fine. The question is, fifty years from now, will we be able to live on it if we keep doing business the way we're currently doing business? And the answer is no. So there is an imperative. And when you when you look at the birth of of capitalism from 1750, 1760, the time of the Industrial Revolution, the publication of the Wealth of Nations, the beginning of the USA, you look till now, human prosperity dramatically greater. I mean, the average the per capita uh, wealth of uh, humans around the planet was five hundred dollars uh, at in 1750. 
It's more than $10,000 now, and it's $54,000 in the United States of America. And that's a reflection of the benefits of unconscious capitalism. So even the improperly and unfully realized vision of Smith, just half of his wisdom, the wealth of nations, has resulted in so much greater prosperity for all of humanity. And if we look at extreme poverty from 1750 to now, we see it going down, down, down dramatically. So this growth in prosperity and this alleviation of extreme poverty driven by capitalism is a wonderful thing for humanity, except it was also predicated on the idea that the Earth's resources were somehow unlimited. Well, surprise, they're not. So we've reached this inflection point where we really urgently must bring back everything that Adam Smith wrote mm -hmm. in the theory of moral sentiment. And, that's, and we're seeing this happening. That was the Business Roundtable's declaration that the doctrine of shareholder primacy has outlived its usefulness. Now, the question is, how do you shift to this notion of stakeholders rather than just shareholders? Now, shareholders are stakeholders, but so are your employees, so are your customers, so is your community, so is the environment, so are the vendors. And the cool thing is, it'd be one thing if we were to say, okay, let's save the world, let's be nicer, let's be more environmental, let's 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 be caring and all that good stuff, uh, but it's going to cost us in a big way. Uh, that's not what we're asking people to do. My co-author, Professor Raj Sasodi, has done the research. He has put together the data that demonstrates very clearly that the companies, like the ones we write about in the book and that he wrote about in his previous books, they're not only happier places to work. They're not only on the great places to work lists uh, time and time again. They're not only loved by their customers and even their vendors and their communities, they are way more profitable. It seems like such a time on some level of survival at the moment, and, and that may be a perception from the news, which I call negative worthless stimulation. But, but people feel like, I'm lucky if I have a job. How do we choose which companies to work for or choose. I keep reading about Amazon day after day, about employees getting hurt, about, about you know, um, Amazon basic uh, batteries and poisoning of, of water sources and stuff. How do we choose in this world? It's not as black and white as I'd like it to be to support that which supports us. First is to recognize the difference and that you do have a choice. That if you know that there are organizations that are genuinely devoted to making the world a better place, if you know that there are companies where employees can't wait to go to work, put those on your list of where you want to work. If you're just looking, you know, if you're looking for a job, really simple. Don't just see, gee, I need to get a job. Say, no, I hear the criteria for what I want to do and the kind of environment in which I want to, to work. Look, this is a movement. There are enough, there are plenty of companies like this. We, we told the story of 25 of them in the heart of the healing organization. And then we also mentioned at least another 10 in the beginning and the end of the book. And they're way, way, way more than the ones we mentioned. We just wrote about the ones that we know the best where we're able to spend time with the CEOs and, and check them out really thor thoroughly and yeah. do our homework on, on the numbers because we really wanted to make sure that they're not just wonderful places to work, but that they really are successful and profitable and making the world a better place, which at, when we went to press, they all were. <laughs> <laughs> things can so, change. Yes, things can change. Uh, having said that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of these, the ones we profiled, they've created such powerful cultures that even when the, the charismatic founder mm -hmm. uh, uh, dies, passes away, retires, the culture seems to stay stay and in a way it even becomes stronger because 
what's been created is more than just the charisma of that leader, Bob Chapman, yes. who's acquired 108 companies. And these are not glamorous companies. I, I like that these you said are, in the book, you said adopted these yes. companies. Right. He doesn't acquire, he adopts. He's like a foster home for, for, for companies, many of whom were in dying, seemingly dying industries mm -hmm. in, in the Midwest, the kinds of businesses that were being transferred completely to Brazil or China. And Bob came in, bought company after company, and he practices what he calls truly human leadership, where what I said earlier, what we discussed earlier about how the soulfulness, the respect, the kindness with which you treat every stakeholder in every interaction is just alive at, at Barry Waymiller. And when people feel valued and feel appreciated, they bring so much more of themselves to their work. They do a much better job. And that results in better products. That results in less cost in making those products. That results in more profit. That results in higher pay for the machinist. That results in a happier family and a, and a, and a healthier community. So everything, this goodness ripples out yeah. in a very positive way. It, it makes me think, and there's the the expression of negotiation from from the Japanese, almost from sumo, of belly to belly. And it makes me think to take a twist on the Godfather expression. It, it how do I put this? It's not business. It's not just business. It is personal. Yes. So that that expression, which is used, it's used. It's a mafia expression, uh, uh, the way it's normally stated. That expression, uh, it's not it's not personal. It's just business. So that's okay. Boom! If I shoot you, and that's just business. Not personal. Well, you know, to 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 the that person's children, that was kind of personal that you just shot their father. Yeah. And to that person's children, it's equally personal that you just fired their mother or their father or their whole family, or that you just destroyed their community for your short term self aggrandizement. So yes, it's always it's always personal. I, I did the research. I found that that expression was coined by an accountant for the mob named yeah. Otto Abadaba Berman, who was gunned down in a mob hit in the Palace Chop House in Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> so wow. ultimately, for Abadaba Berman, it was, it was personal. personal. <laughs> There's some irony to it. I, I, I want to take some more irony and something that we get to get beyond as consumers as we're coming into the holiday season. One that drives me absolutely insane. This guy apps actually had a business school named after him, Sloan and Planned Obsolescence. Yeah. <laughs> how, wrong, yeah. how does it get any more wrong than this? <laughs> well, the real, you know, the, so let's just explain for everybody. Plan obsolescence. I, that you would manufacture something so that just around the time the warranty expires, the car or the washing machine or whatever it is you purchased begins to fall apart so that you have to buy a new model or you have to pay for an extended warranty. Or the phone slows down. Right. So, so right, exactly. So this is this built plant, but here's the really worst thing about planned obsolescence. Mm -hmm. Besides the fact that it's obviously exploitive of customers and the and earth wildly ex exploitive of the earth. Uh, Cause it's, it's, it's building things not to last yes. on purpose, but the really, the really, awful thing is that it fed into an even bigger cultural notion that is still pervasive in the U.S. today, because in the U.S. we apply planned obsolescence to humans. So unlike other cultures where when you're an elder, you are venerated as someone with life experience, with wisdom, in this culture, you're forced to retire and you are 
you're denigrated openly across many platforms. If if people said uh, about any other distinction what they say about older people, they'd be you know they'd lose their jobs, they they'd be fired from their media position. You can't say anything, and and nor should you. It's it's obviously ignorant and 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 obnoxious to say anything about anyone based on their race, their gender. It, you know, it's, it's kind of absurd. It's amazing. We still even have to talk about it, but there's still a lot of work to do just to get people not to refer in derogatory terms to people based on the difference of gender or race or nationality or religion. However, there's been a huge uh, shift in terms of the fact that it, it's it's not as easy to get away with that kind of obvious nastiness as it used to be, at least in the corporate world. Yeah. But people still say things about older people that if you said about someone because their gender was different or their race was different, you'd lose your job, you'd be you'd never be allowed on TV or podcasts again. And it's the stupidest form of discrimination, and I'll explain why. Thank you. Because if you if you denigrate someone because they're a different race than you, mm-hmm. but you're not going to be that race in this lifetime. Same thing if you have a problem with the other gender or with a, a whole spectrum of gender, whatever your issues are around all that. If you give anybody a hard time about that, unless you go through a big change, you're not going to shift your gender or your race. But I'll tell you what, yeah, you will be old. <laughs> you will be old. So any, any obnoxious thing you say about aging when you're younger is a negative hypnosis to your future self. It, it, it also, it makes me think we had on, um, uh, is it uh, Carl Kirkgaard? Carl Kirk Carlgaard, excuse me, of um, Forbes, who was talking about uh, Forbes magazine. He's a Forbes publisher, and he was talking about um, late bloomers, <laughs> and late bloomers in this case being 30s and 40s versus this this culture which puts up as a deity youth. And, and you're over the hill, no new ideas by the time you're 30. You're out of here, at least in Silicon Valley, which is talking about everything being disposable, which is the exact antithesis of how we're going to make it through this challenge. Exactly, the exact antithesis. And that notion that somehow this 18 to 28 is this kind of sweet spot for what you're supposed to look like think like, feel like, what you, what every marketing is driven towards. And maybe you can be kind of oblivious between 18 and 28. It does seem like you have endless energy and possibility. You could party all night, get up early the next morning, no problem. But that's a really short window. It goes very quickly. Yes. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's go from this evil laughter. We're going to talk the second half of this. I want to talk about all, all positive companies and what they're doing. But before we do that, let's talk about the Lucifer effect, Stanley Milgram and shock experience and what we can do when we're in a company that is performing these shock experiments on their employees or customers. So after World War II, yeah. Stanley Milgram, who was a professor at Yale, was really curious as to whether or not people in Germany who served as concentration camp guards and the people in the towns that watched the trains taking people off to the camps, seeing their neighbors decimated, he, he was just curious, how do people respond to authority? So he set up this experiment in New Haven, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And he got students, I think they were paid $4 a day to be part of this experiment where they were told it was a learning experiment and there was a person who would be behind a glass wall and they were given a shock lever and they were told to give electric shocks to the person performing the learning task when they made a mistake. So a person in a white coat with a clipboard standing there would say the mistake was made please give them the first shock and people would give 
a shock. And you would hear the actor, of course it was an actor, yeah. scream in some degree of pain. Well, more than 65% of the people pulled the lever all the way to 450 volts, triple X, where they were led to believe that they were actually killing the person. And when they would express their concern about it, they would look to the experimenter and say, but this person's suffering. And the, the person would say, the white coat, continue the experiment. I'll take full responsibility. So in other words, if there's a, an authority figure who says you're not responsible, the majority of people will do unbelievable evil. Uh, Milgram never had to take this to Germany because the results were so horrifying yeah. right there in, in, in New Haven. So then Milgram's associate, uh, Philip Zimbardo out at Stanford, did a similar experiment about 10 years later called the Stanford Prison Experiment. What Zimbardo did is he took one large group of young people, and now they're being paid $15 a day, and he randomly, randomly invited them, uh, divided them into two groups, mm -hmm. prison guards and prisoners. And they set up a prison environment, and the prison guards were told, you have the authority, and the prisoners were saying, you will be in prison, and we're going to study the... Uh, you know, they always give them some other idea of what this is supposed to be right. about. But it was really about was what happens when you put one person in authority over another person without careful controls and and they had to stop the experiment very soon because the people designated the guards were abusing the people designated as prisoners, and you have to understand, these were just randomly selected. This dynamic, the hierarchy, yeah. brings out the worst in people. So the Lucifer effect is, the way, the way I like to think of it, we all know the idea that there are, you know, a bad apple can spoil the barrel. But that's, I don't think the best way to think about it. We look at it that a bad barrel makes it more likely you'll have a bad apple. But the real question is, what about the bad barrel makers? So when companies are set up just to generate short-term profit, that is a bad barrel making system. It creates bad barrels and it creates lots of rotten apples. So what do we do if we're in the barrel and can we actually make a difference when we're feeling we can't? Yes. So this is the thing. The, we, we, in, in the book and in our seminars, now we've done this with huge audiences. It's quite moving. We, we actually, we ask people that are taking the healing or organization oath, the healing organization oath. And just like you know, if you go to medical school and you become a doctor, you take an oath, first do no harm. We are championing the idea that if you work in a business, you want to take that same first oath, first do no harm. Mm -hmm. And the second one, the second part of the oath is in Latin, it's malus eradicare, means uh, uh, eradicate evil. Yeah. Yeah. Don't collude with evil. So make, you have to make a conscious decision not to go along with evil. Because when individual people are willing to be heroic, mm -hmm. they can change everything. And we see this, you know, we see one of the stories that's painfully familiar to many people, the uh, big bank that was not long ago paid a billion dollar fine that had 500 thousand fake accounts open in the name of customers mm -hmm. by salespeople who are churning commissions. Now it's hard to, I really don't think that these people went, got their uh, CFA, which, you know, charter financial analyst or an MBA and majoring in finance went to work for this big bank. I can't really imagine these people at the beginning of their career thought, gee, 
I want to go out into the world of banking so I can defraud customers for some short-term self-aggrandizement. No, they just were in a bad barrel uh, uh, and it brought out lots of rotten apples. How was it brought down? Because people did stand up to it. People did expose it. People did say, wait a minute, this is not okay. Uh, we see this, you know, and it, the great news is, on the one hand, the bad news is we're seeing lots of evil. We're seeing lots of negative stuff. It's it's happening right in front of us. A lot of people are in shock, and that's why they're feeling disempowered. The other side of it is actually is really, especially in business, harder to get away with this stuff now than it ever has been. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> So so let's talk about a few a few of your favorite a uh, favorite companies here, and um, out of all of the companies since we just went to Southwest and and and, and I've got Jaipur Rugs I've got a DTE I've got so many out of all of the companies which one expresses the most positive story or or best model for us to understand yes. moving forward? That's it's a wonderful question because I love all of the stories, but the story that that. I think give people the most hope is the story of FIFCO, yes, which is the Costa Rican company run by a gentleman named Rafael Mendiola Sanchez. We were together a couple of weeks ago. I was co-chairing the Conscious Capitalism CEO Summit, yep. and he was one of our featured speakers because the, the the theme of the summit was the healing organization. The other co-chair was my co-author, uh, Raj Sisodia, and Kip Tyndall from the Container Store, another wonderful, positive, conscious healing organization. Yeah. But Raphael's story, the reason it's its my answer to your question, is that he got his MBA mm -hmm. and he went to work maximizing shareholder value, and he did it for Philip Morris. And you know, it didn't particularly concern him that he was helping – to kill more people uh, uh, by creating more emphysema and cancer and so on, because it's just that's business. It's not personal. It's business. That's the dominant assumption. But what's curious is he's a thoughtful and sensitive guy. And when you're in that business, you have to deal with lots of regulators and activists. And so he got he got skilled at dealing with those people. Eventually, he was recruited by FIFCO to take over. It was around 2004, 2005, mm -hmm. and. At first, he just said about FIFCO's business is beer and sugary soft drinks. So he went basically from killing people with nicotine and chemical additives to killing them with unnecessary sugar and drunken driving <laughs> and alcoholism. So he focused on what he was trained to do, which is helping them be more profitable. And he streamlined uh, their functions and he brought in the right consultants and he optimized their functioning as a business. But as time went on, he was having to deal with the regulators who regulate things like the health of the community and drunken driving and not to mention the environmental impact that they were having in terms of solid waste, in terms of emissions, in terms of water when you make beer, all this sort of stuff. They're Packaging, and something happened. The spark of conscience, yes, began began to arise in his heart and his mind, and he he shifted his way of relating to the activists and the regulators, and he began to think, what if I thought of these people as our partners, as stakeholders? instead of as the enemy. So in the sugar realm, I mean, they're in the soft drink business. What's he going to do? I'll tell you what he did. He got their flavor scientists together and he said, we got to figure out how to reduce the sugar level in all our drinks by a minimum of 50%. And he gave them a year to do it. They did it in less than six months. Because they were so psyched to be given a task to do something that would help mm. people. They then 
got a task force together to figure out how they could change patterns of drinking in the communities where they were selling beer because what they discovered was people would binge drink and then get into a fight or get into an accident. So they worked with an NGO to figure out this campaign to promote moderate drinking, have a beer with your tortilla, with your enchilada, maybe a second, and that's it. Drive home safely, be with your family. So they, they created a, a different way of thinking about the consumption of their other main product, and it worked. So obesity levels in the schools went down, drunken driving went down. Then they got to work on the environment. And Ramon said to his people, we're going to become net zero in all of our environmental impacts by 2018, mm. which they achieved. But that wasn't good enough. He said, we're going to be a 10% positive remediator of awesome. environmental concerns across all of these impact areas. So let me give you one. one this is one of my favorite examples of what he did. Solid waste. He got together teams, which this exists to this day, of uh, his shareholders, mm -hmm. his employees, their customers, and their vendor partners. And they went around and they picked up the solid waste at their competitors' factories. <laughs> How much do people love this company? It's the number one most beloved company in Costa Rica. Profits have gone way, way, way up. Mm -hmm. People love, love, love this company. People fly in from all over the world to see how Ramon and his team are doing this. And they're continuing. They're not, they're not satisfied with what they've done. They're continually getting together because what they've realized is the purpose of business must be to heal the world first. And the good news is if you take that as your purpose, you'll make more money too. So once you get that, how could you ever consider doing anything else? Now, I, I, I teach people to work intentionally, whether that's a CEO, whether that's a, a, uh, a plumber or janitor or anywhere in between. We could set this intention each day before we go into work, whatever we do, that I am going to use this as an opportunity to help heal the world. Amen, brother. Well, that healing means, the word healing means to restore to wholeness. So first we must heal ourselves. And when we align our daily life around a higher intention, we integrate our mind, our body, our emotions, our energy. We become more whole because we're connected to a conscious higher intention or purpose. And then as we began our conversation, our emotions and intentions are contagious. So that energy affects other people and helps to facilitate and move them towards more wholeness. So, and we also, we also feel more powerful mm -hmm. because we realize that we are consciously choosing to make a difference, even in the smallest things that we do. Woohoo! Yay! Okay. I've got a YouTube live later today where I'm talking about re-envisioning our life and, and throwing out all of our assumptions of what's possible and what's not possible. And a big theme that's in this book is, is not only just that, but it's embracing innocence and humility. Yes. Yes. So this, it's, it's, it's quite wonderful that the senior leaders that we spent time with, the ones we got to know. And I have to say, it's not just for this book. It's pretty much throughout my whole career. Yeah. The, the, the leaders that I've been blessed to work with, helping them build cultures to support innovation, creativity, they're wildly successful people. And they all have this genuine quality of humility, innocence, openness, playfulness. It's, it's also known as the common touch. And it's what we talked about again, to start with it, just they recognize that on the level of the soul, we're all one. We might have different titles, but at the level of the soul, the level of our fundamental being, we're all part of one tapestry of the universe. So 
from that understanding, one naturally treats other. There are no others. There, we're all. If we're really one, there really are no others. So you wouldn't be. You'd never be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. You have a sense of connection. You have a sense of respect, caring, what Martin Buber called the I and the thou, instead of what we see too often in hurting organizations is the I and the it. Right. So we see too often we treat people in a transactional way yeah. to just do some external task, but then we become transactional robots ourselves. Now, what's fascinating, though, is when we connect with our own soulfulness with a higher intention and we connect with other people that way, we're actually more efficient and effective and we tend to do a better job. <laughs> so it's just a wiser way uh, of operating. And that's the third element of the healing oath, which is amor vincit omnia, mm -hmm. love conquers all, always operate from love. So what the, you know, what the healing organization is about is how do you run your business from joy and love instead of fear and greed? And that's a conscious decision we get to make each and every day. It's like being on a diet and having food in the house because your kids don't want to eat the same foods you want. You get to make that conscious decision over <laughs> and over and over <laughs> again. How do I operate from love? How do I operate from love? How do I operate from love? Big time. And, and look, let's be clear. We all experience the impulse of fear. Mm -hmm. We all experience the impulse of greed and self-interest. And this you know, comes back to Adam Smith. He said that human nature is driven first by self-interest, but that that self-interest is naturally balanced with care and empathy for others because it's in our self-interest to ensure the welfare of others. Even if you don't understand, as Leonardo da Vinci said, that everything really is connected to everything else, even if you don't have that level of enlightenment yet. So even if you don't get it, it's still a better way to, to act. But if you get it, then you'll act that way naturally. And you don't need all sorts of rules and regulations and behaviors prescribed for you. You don't need commandments because you naturally act According, you don't need the golden rule because the golden rule is just an expression of a natural understanding of connectedness. Woohoo! Can you imagine? <laughs> you know, what really kept him in check is Abigail. Can you imagine if we were nurturing? If we treated everyone and everything, not from a looking down on, not from an overprotective, but from a nurturing perspective, as if it was a baby in our arms and that baby was us, if we brought that nurturing na uh, uh, nature to everything that we do. Well, that, you know, that's what Bob Chapman does at Barry Waymiller Companies. That's what truly human leadership is about. But, you know, and Bob got this. This was an epiphany. He was in church. And it was a really inspiring sem uh, sermon by his pastor. And he said, you know, that he was looking at how touched people were. He said, but the pastor only has these people for one hour a week. He said, in my, in my companies, I have these people for f at least 40 hours in the week. He said, everyone is someone's precious child. He said, I want to figure out a leadership approach that looks to the best in people and what we know, we know this is research validated. When you look for the best in people, you are much more likely to find it. Absolutely. And when you look for the worst in them, it really is a self-fulfilling prophecy. This is called the Rosenthal effect, also known as the Pygmalion effect. When teachers are told that their students are gifted, they perform 25% better. And when they're told that they're slow, they perform 25% less. And the same thing works with army drill sergeants. If the army drill sergeant is told this is a, a high potential recruit group, at the end of six weeks, they do 25% more push-ups. And if the drill sergeant is told these are slackers, at the end, they're 25% lower in all the performance metrics. So expectation matters tremendously. So think about what that means for your expectation of yourself. 
right? So for your expectation of what's possible for you, begin dreaming big, begin thinking big, begin thinking about, well, what if, and that what if question opens up all kinds of new possibilities. That's the beginning. That's a, the first question for creative thinking. Awesome. 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 So on that note, where can people go, Michael, to find this book, to find your other books on creative thinking, to find all of your work and to find out more? Best place is michaelgelb.com. Lots of free articles, really good stuff. Sign up for our free newsletter. And in addition to michaelgelb.com, mm -hmm. I also suggest people go to healingorganizations.com where they can read some free excerpts from the book and they can also take the healing oath. We have a change.org petition. Yep. We're asking people to go to that petition and obviously after you contemplate it and think it over, make sure it's genuine to you and authentic to you, you may want to sign that petition. So that's at healingorganizations.com, but start with michaelgelb.com. Fantastic. And and I think it would be awesome if we all took that oath. I'm completely biased, Michael. I'm going to take that oath there as well. But if we can approach the world from a place of one, from a place of love, how could we not change everything? Forget about seven gens. How can we not change this everything generation. in right, one? Right now. Bingo. No. And, and this is the thing is, people... People forget, and we're here to remind them and remind ourselves every day that when an idea is just right for its time, it may be the most powerful thing in, in our world. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. This has been phenomenal. Any last words you want to share with people before I let you go today? I, we could go on and on, you and I, forever, so... <laughs> <laughs> Got it. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the healing organization and begin changing at work and changing the world today and shine bright. Woohoo! Hey. <laughs> Thank you so, so much, Michael. My pleasure. That was so much fun as always. I just had the most beautiful, inspiring interview with Michael Gelb on the healing organization. To check out more incredible, inspiring videos to help change your life and change the world, click here, subscribe below, and be sure to click on the bell icon to be notified of upcoming shows.